George Glenn Jones was born on September 12, 1931, in Saratoga, Texas, and was raised in Colsomel, Texas, with his brother and five sisters in the Big Thicket region of Southeast Texas. His father, George Washington Jones, worked in a shipyard and played harmonica and guitar, while his mother, Clara Patterson, played piano in the Pentecostal church on Sundays. During his delivery, one of the doctors dropped Jones and broke his arm. When he was seven, his parents bought a radio, and he heard country music for the first time. Jones recalled to Billboard in 2006 that he would lie in bed with his parents on Saturday night listening to the Grand Old Opry and insisting that his mother wake him up if he fell asleep so he could hear Roy Acuff or Bill Monroe. In his autobiography, I Live to Tell It All, Jones explained that the early death of his sister, Ethel, spurred on his father's drinking problem, and by all accounts, George Washington Jones could be physically and emotionally abusive to his wife and children when he drank. In The Life and Times of a Hunky Tonk Legend, Bob Allen recounts how George Washington Jones would return home in the middle of the night with his cronies, roaring drunk, wake up a terrified George Jones and demand that he sing for them or face a beating. In a CMT episode of Inside Fame dedicated to Jones's life, country music historian Robert K. Orman marveled, you would think that it would make him a, not a singer because it was so abusively thrust on him. But the opposite happened. He became a chronic singer. He became someone who had to sing. In the same program, Jones admitted that he remained oblivious and resentful towards his father up until the day he died. And observed in his autobiography, the Jones family makeup doesn't sit well with liquor. Daddy was an unusual drinker. He drank to excess, but never while working and he probably was the hardest working man I've ever known. His father bought him his first guitar at age nine, and he learned his first chords and songs at church. And several photographs show a young George busking on the streets of Beaumont. He left home at 16 and went to Jasper, Texas, where he sang and played on the KTXJ radio station with fellow musician Dalton Henderson. From there, he worked at KRIC radio station. During one such afternoon show, Jones met his idol, Hank Williams. I just stared, he later wrote. In 1989 video documentary, Same Old Me, Jones admitted, I couldn't think or eat nothing unless it was Hank Williams, and I couldn't wait for his next record to come out. He had to be really the greatest. He married his first wife, Dorothy Bonvalen, in 1950, but they divorced in 1951. He was enlisted in the United States Marines until his discharge in 1953. He was stationed in San Jose, California for his entire service. Jones married Shirley Ann Corley in 1954 his first record, The self pen No Money in This Deal, was recorded on January 19th and appeared in February on Star Day Records, beginning the singer's association with producer and mentor H.W. Pappy Daly. The song was actually cut in Star Day Records' co-founders Jack Starnes' living room and produced by Starnes. Jones also worked at KTRM, now KZZB, in Beaumont around this time. DJ Gordon Baxter told Nick Torch that Jones acquired the nickname Possum while working there. One of the DJs there, Slim Watts, took to calling him George P. Williker Picklepuss Possum Jones. For one thing, he cut his hair short like a possum's belly. He had a possum nose and stupid eyes like a possum. During his early recording sessions, 
daily admonished Jones for attempting to sound too much like his heroes, Hank Williams and Lefty Frizzell. In later years, Jones would have little good to say about the music production at Starday. Jones' first hit came with Why Baby Why in 1955. That same year, while touring as a cast member of the Louisiana Hayride, Jones met and played shows with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. I didn't get to know him that well, Jones said of Presley to Nick Torch in 1994. He stayed pretty much with his friends around him in his dressing room. Nobody seemed to get around him much any lengths of time to talk to him. Jones would, however, remain a lifelong friend of Johnny Cash's. Jones was invited to sing at the Grand Old Opry in 1956. With Presley's explosion in popularity in 1956, pressure was put on Jones to cut a few rockabilly sides, and he reluctantly agreed. His heart was never in it, however, and he quickly regretted the decision. In his autobiography, he joked, During the years when I encountered those records, I used them for frisbees. He explained to Billboard in 2006, I was desperate. When you're hungry, a poor man with a house full of kids, you're going to do some things you ordinarily wouldn't do. I said, well, hell, I'll try anything once. I tried, daggum, it, how come it, and rock it, and a bunch of shit. I didn't want my name on the rock and roll thing, so I told him to put Thumper Jones on it. And if it did something good, if it did in hell, I didn't want to be shamed with it. Jones went on to say he successfully attempted to buy all the masters to keep the cuts from surfacing later, which they did. Jones moved to Mercury in 1957. In early 1957, Jones teamed up with singer Jeanette Hicks, the first of several duet partners he would have over the years, and enjoyed yet another top ten single with Yearning. Starday Records merged with Mercury that same year, and Jones scored high marks on the charts with his debut Mercury release of Don't Stop the Music. Meanwhile, Jones was traveling the back top roads in a 1940 Packard with his name and phone number emblazoned on the side. Although he was garnering a lot of attention and his singles were making very respectable showings on the charts, Jones was still playing the blood bucket circuit of honky-tonks that dotted the rural countryside. In 1959, Jones had his first number one on the Billboard country chart with White Lightning, ironically a more authentic rock and roll sound than his half-hearted rockabilly cuts. In the same old me retrospective, Johnny Cash insisted, George Jones would have been a really hot rockabilly artist if he had approached it from that angle. Well, he was really, but never got credit for it. White Lightning was written by J.P. Richardson. One aspect of Jones's early career that might be overlooked is his success as a songwriter. He wrote or co-wrote many of his biggest hits during this period, several of which have become standards, such as Window Up Above, later a smash for Mickey Gilly in 1975, and Seasons of My Heart, a hit for Johnny Cash, and also recorded by Willie Nelson and Jerry Lee Lewis. Jones wrote just one more, also recorded by Cash, Life to Go, a top five hit for Stonewall Jackson in 1959. You Gotta Be My Baby, and Don't Stop the Music, on his own, and had a hand in writing Color of the Blues, covered by Loretta Lynn and Elvis Costello, Tender Years, and Tall Tall Trees, co-written with Roger Miller. Jones' most frequent songwriting collaborator was his childhood friend, Daryl Edwards. Jones signed with United Artists in 1962 and immediately scored one of his biggest hits of his career, She Thinks I Still Care. 
His voice had grown noticeably deeper during this period, and he began cultivating the singing style that became uniquely his own. During his stint with UA, Jones recorded tribute albums to Hank Williams and Bob Wills, and cut an album of duets with Melba Montgomery, including the hit, We Must Have Been Out of Our Minds. Jones was also well on his way to gaining a reputation as a notorious Hellraiser. In 1964, Pappy Daly secured a new contract with Musicor Records. For the rest of the 1960s, Jones would score only one number one, 1967's Walk Through This World With Me, but he practically owned the country music charts throughout the decade. Significant hits include Love Bug, a nod to Buck Owens and the Bakersfield sound, Things Have Gone to Pieces, the Race is On, My Favorite Lies, I'll Share My World With You, Take Me, a, a song he co-wrote and would later record with Tammy Wynette, A Good Year for the Roses, and If My Heart Had Windows. By this point, Jones' singing style had evolved from the full-throated, high, lonesome sound of Hank Williams and Roy Acuff on his early Star Day records to the more refined, subtle style of Lefty Frizzell. In 2006 interview with Billboard, Jones acknowledged the fellow Texan's influence on his idiosyncratic phrasing. I got that from Lefty. He always made five syllables out of one word. Jones's spin drinking and use of amphetamines on the road caught up with him in 1967 and he had to be admitted into a neurological hospital to seek treatment for his drinking. Jones would go to extreme lengths for a drink if the thirst was on him. Perhaps the most famous drinking story concerning Jones occurred while he was married to his second wife, Shirley Corley. Jones recalled Shirley making it physically impossible for him to travel to Beaumont located eight miles away, to buy liquor. Because Jones would not walk that far, she would hide the keys to each of their cars they owned before leaving. She did not, however, hide the keys to the lawnmower. Upset, Jones walked to the window and looked over his property. He later described his thoughts in his memoir, There, Gleaming in the Glow was the 10 horsepowered rotary engine under a seat, a key glistening in the ignition. I imagine the top speed for that old mower was five miles per hour. It might have taken an hour and a half or more for me to get to the liquor store, but get there I did. Years later, Jones comically mocked the incident by making a cameo in the video for All My Rowdy Friends Are Coming Over Tonight by Hank Williams Jr. He also parodied the episode in the 1993 video for One More Last Chance by Vin Skill and in his own music video for the single Honky Tonk Song in 1996. Curiously, in her 1979 autobiography, Stand By Your Man, Tammy Wynette claimed the incident occurred while she was married to Jones, maintaining that she woke up at one o'clock in the morning to find her husband gone. I got into the car and drove to the nearest bar ten miles away. When I pulled into the parking lot, there sat our rider mower right by the entrance. He'd driven that mower right down a main highway. He looked up and saw me and said, Well, fellas, here she is now, my little wife. I told you she'd come after me. Jones became aware of Tammy Wynette because their tours were booked by the same agency and their paths sometimes crossed after Wynette's first minor hit, Apartment Number 9, in 1966, which was written by Johnny Paycheck. Wynette was married to songwriter Don Chappell, 
who was also the opening act for her shows at the time. The three became friends, but eventually Jones took more than a passing fancy to Wynette, who was 11 years his junior, and grew up listening to all his records. According to his autobiography, Jones went to their house for supper, and while she was fixing the meal, Wynette and Chapel got into a heated exchange with Chapel, calling his wife an SOB. Jones wrote, I felt rage fly all over me. I jumped from my chair, put my hands under the dinner table, and flipped it over. Dishes, utensils, and glasses flew in all directions. Don and Tammy's eyes got about as big as the flying dinner plates. Jones professed his love for Wynette on the spot, and the couple married in 1969. They began touring together, and Jones bought out his contract with MuseCore so he could record with Tammy and her producer Billy Schrill on Epic Records. The singer had split with longtime producer Pappy Daly on acrimonious terms. Jones and Wynette became known as Mr. and Mrs. Country Music in the early 1970s, scoring several big hits including We're Gonna Hold On, Let's Build a World Together, Golden Ring, Near You, and We're Not the Jet Set. When asked about recording Jones and Wynette, Cheryl told Dan Daly in 2002, it did increase my scotch intake some. We started out trying to record the vocals together, but George drove Tammy crazy with his phrasing. He never, ever did it the same way twice. He could make a five-syllable word out of church. Finally, Tammy said, record George and let me listen to it, and then do my vocals after we get his on tape. Tammy was a very quick study. In October of 1970, shortly after the birth of their only child, Tamala Georgette, Jones was straightjacketed and committed to a padded cell at the Watson Clinic in Lakeland, Florida, after a drunken bender. He was kept there to detoxify for 10 days before being released with a prescription for liberal. Jones managed longer stretches of sobriety with Wynette than he had enjoyed in years. But as the decade wore on, his drinking and erratic behavior worsened, leading to the couple's divorce in 1976. Jones accepted the responsibility for the failure of the marriage, but vehemently denied Wynette's allegation in her idle biography that he beat her and fired a shotgun at her. Remarkably, Jones and Wynette continued playing shows and drawing crowds in the years after their divorce, as fans began to see their songs mirroring their stormy relationship. In 1980, they recorded the album Together Again and scored a hit with Two Story House. In the 2019 Ken Burns documentary Country Music, Cheryl remembered this time by comparing Jones and Wynette to two wounded animals. Jones also spoke publicly about his hopes for a reconciliation and would jokingly reference Tammy in some of his songs during performances of his 1981 hit, If Drinking Don't Kill Me, Her Memory Will. He would sing Tammy's Memory Will. After years of sniping, Jones and Wynette appeared to make peace in the 1990s, recording a final album, and even touring together again before Wynette's death in 1998. In 1995, Jones told Country Weekly, like the old saying goes, it takes time to heal things, and they've been healed quite a while. In the late 1970s, Jones spiraled out of control. Already drinking constantly, a manager named Shug Baggett introduced him to cocaine before a show because he was too tired to perform. The drug increased Jones' already considerable paranoia. During one drinking binge, he shot at and very nearly hit his friend and occasional songwriting partner Earl Peanut Montgomery after Montgomery had quit drinking after finding religion. 
Jones was often penniless and acknowledged in his autobiography that Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash came to his financial aid during this time. Jones also began missing shows at an alarming rate, and lawsuits from promoters started piling up. In 1978, owing Wynette $36,000 in child support and claiming to be $1 million in debt, he filed for bankruptcy. Jones appeared incoherent at times, speaking in quarreling voices that he would later call the duck and the old man. In his article, The Devil and George Jones, Nick Torres stated, By February 1979, he was homeless, deranged, and destitute, living in his car and barely able to digest the junk food on which he sustained. He weighed under 100 pounds, and his condition was so bad that it took him more than two years to complete My Very Special Guest an album on which Willie Nelson, Linda Rodstad, Elvis Costello, and other famous fans came to his vocal aid and support. Jones entered Hillcrest Psychiatric Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. Upon his release in January 1980, the first thing he did was pick up a six-pack. Jones often displayed a sheepish, self-deprecating, sense of humor regarding his dire financial standing and bad reputation. In June 1979, he appeared with Waylon Jennings on Ralph Emery's syndicated radio program, and at one point Jennings cracked, It's lonely at the top. A laughing Jones replied, It's lonely at the bottom, too. It's real, real lonely, Waylon. Despite his chronic unreliability, Jones was still capable of putting a captivating live show on. On Independence Day 1976, he appeared at Willie Nelson's 4th of July picnic in Gonzales, Texas, in front of 80,000 younger, country rock-oriented fans. A nervous Jones fell out of his comfort zone and nearly bolted from the festival, but went on anyway and wound up stealing the show. By the 1980s, Jones had not had a number one single in six years, and many critics began to write him off. However, the singer stunned the music industry in April when He Stopped Loving Her Today was released and shot to number one on the country charts, remaining there for 18 weeks. The song, written by Bobby Braddock and Curly Putman, tells the story of a friend who has never given up on his love. He keeps old letters and photos from back in the day and hangs on to hope that she would come back again. The song reaches its peak in the chorus, revealing that he indeed stopped loving her when he died. And the woman does return for his funeral. Joan's interpretation Buoyed by his delivery of the line, first time I've seen him smile in years, gives it a mournful, gripping realism. It is constantly voted as one of the greatest country songs of all time, along with I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry by Hank Williams and Crazy by Patsy Cline. According to producer Billy Sherrill and Jones himself, the singer hated the song when he first heard it. In Bob Island's biography of the singer, Cheryl states he thought it was too long, too sad, too depressing, and that nobody would ever play it. He hated the melody and wouldn't learn it. Cheryl also claimed that Jones frustrated him by continually singing the song to the melody of the Chris Christopherson hit Help me make it through the night. In the same old me retrospective, Cheryl recalls a heated exchange during one recording session. I said, that's not the melody. And he said, yeah, but it's a better melody. I said, it might be. Christopherson would think so too. It's his melody. 
In the same documentary, Cheryl claims that Jones was in such bad shape physically during this period that the, re the recitation was recorded 18 months after the first verse was, and added that the last words Jones said about he stopped loving her today was nobody will buy that morbid son of a... Although he had disliked he stopped loving her today when it was first offered to him, Jones ultimately gave the song credit for reviving his flagging career, stating a four-decade career had been salvaged by a three-minute song. Jones earned the Grammy Award for Best Male Country Vocal Performance in 1980. The Academy of Country Music awarded the song Single of the Year and Song of the Year in 1980. It also became the Country Music Association's Song of the Year in both 1980 and 1981. The success of He Stopped Loving Her Today led CBS Records to renew Jones's recording contract and spark new interest in the singer. He was the subject of an hour and a quarter long HBO television special entitled George Jones with a little help from his friends which had him performing songs with Waylon Jennings, Elvis Costello, Tanya Tucker, and Tammy Wynette, among others. Jones continued drinking and using cocaine. Appearing at various award shows to accept honors for He Stopped Loving Her Today, arguably inebriated. Like when he performed I Was Country When Country Wasn't Cool with Barbara Mandrell at the 1981 Country Music Association Awards. He was involved in several high-speed car chases with police, which were reported on the national news, and one arrest was filmed by a local TV crew. The video, which is widely available online, offers a glimpse into Jones's alter ego when drinking as he argues with the police officer and lunges at the cameraman. Conversely, when sober, Jones was known to be friendly and down-to-earth, even shy. In a 1994 article on Jones, Nick Torshus remarked that when he first interviewed the singer in April of 1976, one could readily believe the accounts by those who had known him for years that he had not changed much at all, and that he had been impervious to fame and fortune. In an unusual, unguarded self-appraisal in 1981, the singer told Mark Rose of the Village Voice, I don't show a lot of affection. I have probably been an unliked person among family, like somebody who is heartless. I save it all for the songs. I didn't know you were supposed to show that you love person to person. I guess I always wanted to, but I didn't know how. The only way I could would be to do it in a song. Years later, he commented to the Chris Christian Broadcasting Network, Scott Ross, about himself. I think you're mad at yourself. I think that you're saying to yourself, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve those fans. You don't deserve making this money. And you're mad at yourself. And you beat up on yourself by drinking and losing friends that won't put up with that. It's just one terrible big mess you make out of your life. Jones never understood why people would pay to hear him sing. His run of hits also continued in the early 1980s. With the singer charting, I'm not ready yet. Same Old Me, back by the Oak Ridge Boys, Still Doing Time, Tennessee Whiskey, We Didn't See a Thing, a duet with Ray Charles, and I Always Get Lucky with You, which was Jones's last number one in 1984. In 1981, Jones met Nancy, I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name, a 34-year-old divorcee from Mainsfield, Louisiana. Nancy's positive impact on Jones's life and career cannot be overstated. She eventually cleaned up his finances, kept him away from his drug dealers, and managed his career. 
Jones always gave her complete credit for saving his life. Nancy, who did not drink, explained to Nick Torsett in 1994, he was drinking, but he was fun to be around. It wasn't love at first sight or anything like that, but I saw what a good person he was deep down, and I couldn't help caring about him. Jones managed to quit cocaine, but went on a drunken rampage in Alabama in the fall of 1983. By that time, though, physically and emotionally exhausted, he really did want to quit drinking. In March 1984 in Birmingham, Alabama, at the age of 52, Jones performed his first sober show since the early 1970s. All my life it seems I've been running from something, he told the United Press International in June. If I knew what it was, maybe I could run in the right direction. But I always seem to end up going the other way. Jones began making up many of the dates he had missed, playing them for free to pay back promoters, and began opening his concerts with No Show Jones a song he had written with Glenn Martin that poked fun at himself and other country singers. Jones always stressed that he was not proud of the way he treated loved ones and friends over the years and was ashamed of disappointing his fans when he missed shows, telling Billboard in 2006, I know it hurt my fans in a way, and I've always been sad about that. It really bothered me for a long time. Mostly sober for the rest of the 1980s, Jones consistently released albums with Cheryl producing, including Shine On, Jones Country, You've Still Got a Place in My Heart, Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes, Wine Colored Roses, an album Jones would tell Jolene Downs in 2001 was one of his personal favorites. Too Wild, Too Long, in One Woman Man. Jones' video for his 1985 hit, Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes, won the CMA Award for Video of the Year. Billy Sherrill makes a cameo as the bus driver. In 1990, Jones released his last proper studio album on Epic, You Ought to Be Here With Me. Although the album featured several stirring performances, including the lead single, Hell Stays Open All Night Long, and the Roger Miller penned title song, the single did poorly and Jones made the switch to MCA, ending his relationship with Cheryl and what was now Sony Music after 19 years. His first album with MCA, and along came Jones, was released in 1991 and backed by MCA's powerful promotion team and producer Kyle Leaning, who had produced a string of hit albums for Randy Travis. The album sold better than his previous one had. However, two singles, You Couldn't Get the Picture, and She Loved a Lot in Her Time, a tribute to Jones's mother Clara, did not crack the top 30 on the charts. As Jones lost favor with country music radio, as the format was altered radically during the 1990s. His last album to have any significant radio airplay was in 1992's Walls Can Fall, which featured the novelty song Finally Friday and I Don't Need Your Rocking Chair, a testament to his continued vivaciousness in old age. Despite the lack of radio airplay, Jones continued to record and tour throughout the 1990s and was introduced into the Country Music Hall of Fame by Randy Travis in 1992. In 1996, Jones released his autobiography, I Live to Tell It All, with Tom Carter, and the irony of his long career was not lost on him with the singer writing in its preface, I also know that a lot of my show business peers are going to be angry after reading this book. So many have worked so hard to maintain their careers. 
I never took mine seriously, and yet it's flourishing. He also pulled no punches about his disappointment in the direction country music had taken, devoting a full chapter to the changes in the country music scene of the 1990s that had him removed from radio playlists in favor of younger generation of pop-influenced country stars. Despite his absence from the country charts during this time, latter-day country superstars such as Garth Brooks, Randy Travis, Alan Jackson, and many others often paid tribute to Jones while expressing their love and respect for his legacy as a true country legend who paved the way for their own success. While Jones remained committed to pure country, he worked with the top producers and musicians of the day, and the quality of his work remained high. Some of his significant performances included I Must Have Done Something Bad, Wild Irish Rose, Billy B. Bad, a sarcastic jab at country music's establishment trendsetters. A Thousand Times a Day, When the Last Curtain Falls, and the novelty song, High Tech Redneck. Jones' most popular song in his later years was Choices, the first single from his 1999 studio album, Cold Hard Truth. A video was made for the song, and Jones won another Grammy for Best Male Country Vocal Performance. The song was at the center of controversy when the Country Music Association invited Jones to perform it on the awards show, but required that he perform an abridged version. Jones refused and did not attend the show. Alan Jackson was disappointed with the association's decision, and halfway through his own performance during the show, he signaled to his band and played part of Jones' song in protest. On March 6, 1999, Jones was involved in an accident when he crashed his sport utility vehicle near his home. He was taken to the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where he was released two weeks later. In May of that year, Jones pleaded guilty to drunk driving charges related to the accident. In his memoirs, published three years earlier, Jones admitted that he sometimes had a glass of wine before dinner and that he still drank beer occasionally, but insisted I don't squirm in my seat, fighting the urge for another drink, and speculated, perhaps I'm not a true alcoholic, in the modern sense of the word. Perhaps I was just an old-fashioned drunk. The crash was a significant turning point, as he explained to Billboard in 2006. When I had that wreck, I made up my mind. It put the fear of God in me. No more smoking. No more drinking. I didn't have to have no help. I made up my mind to quit. I don't crave it. After the accident, Jones went on to release the Gospel Collection in 2003, for which Billy Sherrill came out of retirement to produce. He appeared at a televised Johnny Cash Memorial Concert in Jonesboro, Arkansas in 2003, singing Big River with Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson. In 2008, Jones received the Kennedy Center Honors along with Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey of The Who, Barbara Streisand, Morgan Freeman, and Twyla Tharp. President George W. Bush disclosed that he had many of Jones' songs on his iPod. Jones also served as judge in 2008 for the 8th Annual Independent Music Awards to support independent artists' careers. And Rolling Stone named him number 43 in their 100 Greatest Singers of All Time issue. An album titled Hits I Missed and Ones I Didn't in which he covered hits he had passed on, as well as remakes of his own He Stopped Loving Her Today, would be released as his final studio album. In 2012, Jones received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. On March 29, 2012, 
Jones was taken to the hospital with an upper respiratory infection. Months later, on May 21st, Jones was hospitalized again for his infection and was released five days later. On August 14, 2012, Jones announced his farewell tour, the Grand Tour, with scheduled stops at 60 cities. His final concert was held in Knoxville at the Knoxville Civic Coliseum on April 6, 2013. Jones was scheduled to perform his final concert at the Bridgestone Arena on November 22, 2013. However, on April 18, 2013, Jones was taken to VUMC for a slight fever and irregular blood pressure. His concerts in Alabama and Salem were postponed as a result. Following six days in intensive care at VUMC, Jones died on April 26, 2013, at age 81. According to Boot.com, his wife, Nancy, described his final words. We were standing at the foot of his bed, and George just hadn't said nothing, and all of a sudden he opened his eyes, and I was fixing to go towards him, and the doctor kind of held me back, and George said, Well, hello there. I've been looking for you. My name's George Jones. Within moments, the 81-year-old was gone. He closed his eyes, and that was the end of it. Nancy Jones explains, so in my heart I know he was talking to God. With that, we lost a legend. George Jones was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in Nashville. His death made headlines all over the world. Many country stations, as well as a few of the other formats, such as oldies and classic hits, abandoned or modified their playlist and played his songs throughout the day. The week after Jones's death, He Stopped Loving Her Today re-entered the hot country song at number 21. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Sure would help us out a lot with YouTube.